All right, so uh, today we have a um, basically an opportunity for us to do some exercises, um, both as a class together and then in small groups, and then we'll bring them back together in a class uh, to make sure that we are um, all kind of understanding the causal loop diagrams up until this point, and then moving toward how we build even more complex causal loop diagrams, which will be the major topic of Thursday's lecture. With respect to that, um, I posted an announcement on Canvas that there was the assignment uh, B2 that was due last Sunday. I'd gone through all of those and I had taken a quick look at everyone's submission, trying to anticipate all the ways that, um, that Eric might take off points when he goes through and grades all of those, and then made notes um, about you know, things that I thought you know, might have uh, points taken off of. And so then I went and then extended the deadline until Wednesday night so that people had an opportunity if they would like <clears throat> to make revisions to that and then re-upload without any penalty. And then Eric will end up grading the most recent submission. So if you're happy with your submission, you can leave it alone. If you feel like you want to um, make updates to that submission based on the feedback that I gave you, then you can go ahead and do that. Um, just keep in mind that there will be a new assignment um, that uh, we'll give today that will be due soon. And uh, then you've got your readings to give off on as well and so uh there's so there's you know just there's still other things in the mix but uh so if you're going to take advantage of that uh you know extension then probably be a good time good idea to knock it out you know today uh then rather than trying to wait until do everything you know wednesday night the readings and that so just a heads up with that if you missed that just go to canvas and you can read the announcement about that i also posted a message on slack all right any questions about that before we move forward Great, and if you didn't see, um, if if you got, so to make, to see the feedback that I gave, just go into that assignment. I think you, from your perspective, it'd be like going in to see what its grade would be, and you should be able to see submission comments, and that's where you'll see my comments. And I think I've left some sort of comments on everybody's, even people who I thought um, did, you know, 100% well, I tried to at least say, looks really good or something like that. So um, if even if you didn't get a notification, you probably have some sort of comment there and it's a good idea to check it out and see what notes that I left there. There's a chance that, you know, if I didn't notice anything, then maybe I didn't leave a comment, but I think I at least tried to at least give people thumbs up if I thought things were going okay. All right, so, um, uh, Today, we, like I said, this week, we're kind of moved towards building more complex causal loop diagrams. We've so far been mainly focusing on, except for one or two cases, um, focusing on single loops. And we want to build towards thinking about, you know, what happens when multiple loops interact. And so we've already talked about escalation as one example of this. And, you know, there are plenty of other examples. And so um, this is just one that I, you know, went Googling for and found out that, you know, this is one that um, Met Office, that's like the UK version of the Weather Channel. And they had this little graphic that they were using to communicate to people that global warming has a number of different types of feedbacks that contribute to it. There are these um, positive feedbacks here that are kind of like at the beginning of the previous lecture, we talked about some of these positive feedbacks where global warming becomes a so-called a, a vicious cycle. And then they were sort of suggesting that, <clears throat> that although global warming has these positive feedbacks that uh, contribute to it getting worse and worse and worse, <clears throat> pardon me, Ultimately, there will be negative feedbacks <clears throat> that will slow down the warming. And um, then there's sort of a question here about which one dominates and when does one dominate. And so this, as we'll see, is basically a story of S-shaped growth. You can't ever have growth alone without eventually it being limited. But when we look at this, this narrative here, um, we have to say that this might make sense for just general PR, but if we are thinking about actually building models that help us further play the what if game, then is there the right type of detail in this causal loop diagram? So um, and if we look at this, then we kind of see that the variables that MetOffice has chosen for this diagram aren't really the types of variables that we would wanna put into our causal loop diagrams. So can somebody think of like, um, you know, what are some problems with 
the variables that are chosen here on the kind of, um, you know, these four variables in particular around the corners here. Any thoughts based on the last couple of lectures? So I see um, uh, slows down, speeds up, not measurable. So for the slows down one, what's the problem? I agree that slows down is probably not good. Why isn't slows down a, a good thing to put in a variable in a causal loop diagram? It's a verb, right? So ideally we would like a causal loop diagram to have noun phrases as both the causes and the effects. And then that way we can say, what happens when this noun increases or, and, uh, or this noun phrase increases to the effects that are connected to that noun. And so you can see that there's a sequence of events that's depicted here. Global warming creates change that slows down warming. But if we actually want to try to model what are the concrete things that are moving around in there, whereas global warming, we might be able to, maybe that's a quantifiable thing, creates change because it's a verb. It, we don't really know how to measure creates change. Like, you know, it's hard to say uh, what happens when you increase creates change. Or down here, what happens when you increase slows down warming? Like, it just doesn't phrase, it just doesn't fit together. And so, um, you know, so it's hard to sort of tell, it's like you're kind of fixing our analysis there. We would ideally like to have a model that tells us what happens when warming is increased or warming is decreased uh, for both of those sorts of things. So that kind of suggests that by packing the verb into here, you're kind of tying our hands so we can't play all of the what if games. This sort of only depicts one scenario. So um, now you could say, okay, well then how, what we could we do to fix those things? We could just try removing all the verbs. So if we remove the verbs, then instead of getting creates change, we just get create, or we just get rid of creates and we just get change. Or speeds up warming, we just get warming. Um, but if we do all of that, if we just remove all the verbs, then we just get change, change, warming, and warming. And it somehow uh, you know, and then there's also warming here. So it, it doesn't really actually tell us anything about the process that's going on. So that's the thing about causal loop diagrams is that every cause and effect and link needs to have some way for you to sort of physically justify what's going on. So we don't actually know why um, this loop happens. So we're just sort of taking for granted that there are physical processes that make sense in this positive feedback loop. So ideally, we would like to replace these uh, different variables and also add polarities corresponding to our variable choices here so that we actually can, for each one of these links, have a justifiable physical story. We'll be able to, without any argument, someone will agree that this, that this link that we've drawn here exists. And then if we do that for every one of these links, then the loops that emerge will be loops that we can analyze and no one can argue that those loops are there because they, did, they can't argue with the individual links. So if you can't argue with the links and you put all the links together and you get a loop, you can't argue with a loop. And the loops are where we get the dynamical behavior. And so that allows us to then tell a story like, well, if all of these links exist, then very likely we're going to have this behavior over time. If we just start with the behavior over time and somebody's gonna to come to us and say, I don't really believe in your behavior over time. Why, you know, you drew it this way. Why couldn't it be drawn this other way? And by doing, by building up our models this way, then we actually have um, rigorous support for those behaviors over time. And what we might find is the behavior that we were expecting over time is not actually something that the system produces. We might surprise ourselves. And then that will end up being a useful result we can bring to others. We can say, you might have thought that this is how things would behave over time. But if you put together everything we know about the system, it actually predicts that something else could possibly happen. So that's kind of what we're moving towards here. So can you all remember, um, so if I, um, uh, try a different um, pointer here. So this loop, we kind of did this loop in a more detailed perspective. I think, uh, you know, last lecture, or maybe the lecture before that. Do we have some ideas for what could go in this top uh, box here or this bottom box here? So like um, anybody have sort of thoughts about what would go up here in the top box? So when global warming increases, 
what might we think goes um, uh, goes here? Or can you think of a story that goes under this one? And we, we set up one of those stories last time. So, um, yeah, so I've listed, there's a bunch of things that I've, I've seen here. So I like the idea of, uh, of things like floods, melting, et cetera. All these are kind of uh, good there. Um, and so what I'm going to say here is why don't we just try, um, I've seen ice in there. So let's pick out ice as one of those. And so I'll just go into PowerPoint here and I will write in ugly uh, mouse pen. Um, I was just writing the word pen. So that was not what I wanted. So I'm just gonna write ice up here. So let's, um, now there's other things we could have put up here. So we could have told a story um, about, um, yeah, I like extreme weather. That's another one. You know, we could do a lot of different things here, but let's just put um, ice up here just because that's kind of a story that was told in that loop that we did a couple lectures ago. We could tell other stories about global warming. We're just gonna focus on the ice story right now. So um, as global warming uh, increases, then what would we expect with ice? Would this here be a negative or a positive? I've seen a couple, you can put your votes in the chat. So I've seen some negatives and decreases. Any other thoughts about that? So the thought is here is, is you know, if, if you get increased warming, and so you can think warming is kind of like temperature. So with increased global temperatures, then what happens to ice? And I'm seeing uniformly less ice, negatives, decreases. I think those are all pretty good guesses. So let's put a minus there. And what I mean by that, again, that is something that's easy to defend. So that's what we really wanna do when we come up with these causal links is a simple story that links something very close to something else. We say it's a, it's a proximate cause. And we can say that um, we will get less ice if temperatures go up. There is no way that we can based on the physical properties of ice, there's no other way to say it. If temperatures go up, ice will go down. And so this link from temperatures to ice is going to be negative. All right, so, um, so then we would say, well, then let's figure out something to put in this bottom box over here. So, um, so what, what do you think, what would be another variable? And you can again, try to think back to what we did in that last lecture where we just described the vicious cycle. If, um, if ice uh, is one of our variables and we wanna eventually get back to temperature, then what is another variable we might uh, be putting in there? So, what, um, so right now I'm looking for what, what should we put in this red box down here? So what happens as ice changes? Water temperature, that's a good one. Albedo, that's another one. Anybody else? I see another vote for water, for albedo. So I'm okay with, um, and the people mentioned that there's like environment for Arctic animals and things like that. These are all good water level. These are all great. Um, and it just depends on what story you're trying to tell because we, there are a bunch of things downstream of ice. You're right that if you get more le or less ice, you probably are gonna get higher water levels. And um, that will, that's gonna be very important for some of our stakeholders. And you get less ice, you might have less habitat for polar bears. And that might be very important to some of our stakeholders and so on and so forth. And so we could imagine taking a systems approach that there's a bunch of other links that we could draw out here. And we could then write out, you know, like something here, something here, something here. And a lot of this causal loop diagram initially is just mind mapping. And you can come out and think, all right, so what, what all of the things that are downstream from ice, if we, if we alter the amount of ice in the world, then what are all the things that might be affected by that? We list all of those out there. But, um, but then what we end up finding is that one of them ends up feeding back onto temperature. And that's the one we're gonna put here in this red box or maybe multiple ones. But if we're trying to look for these loops, then maybe once we find these loops, it may not be important for us to keep all of these things, these other ones here. We might use them in other models 
if we're interested in you know habitat loss and things like that but if we're just focusing on the sustainability of you know the uh, habitable temperature on the planet then maybe the feedback is what we're interested in most in so what i'm going to put here and this is just my choice for telling this story is albedo which is the reflectiveness of the ice on the planet. And this again goes along with the story we told last week. And so this, um, again, you may come up with other things that you can put in here and they may be totally correct. I had to choose something for this like, causal loop diagram. And the story I would like to tell is a story where global warming reduces the amount of ice and that's gonna change the albedo, which will end up feeding back onto global warming or global temperatures. But again, I don't want you to, to think like, man, I thought that water level would also fit there. Water level might fit there. And if you can think in this case, because we're trying to fill out this loop, that there is a feedback between water level and temperature, then we definitely could put water level here. But the problem with putting say water level down here is it might be harder for us to then justify well, this link because the average person is not gonna necessarily be able to connect how water level affects global temperatures. So um, if I think about albedo there, let's go, we've got a link here. So how does ice relate to albedo? So if I get an increase in ice, so I cover the planet with more white ice, then what happens to the reflectiveness of the planet? I see a couple of answers in the chat. Right, I see positive. Yeah, it goes up, right? So let's put a plus there. And so um, with more ice, you get more reflectiveness. And then now we have one other link to worry about as the planet becomes more reflective. So the sun's light hits the planet and it bounces off and goes back into space. Um, and so it doesn't have a chance to get converted into heat because it just gets reflected off into space, kind of like the moon reflects its light. As the our earth becomes uh, more white, so the more reflectiveness, then what happens to the global temperature? Is this a plus or a minus? And I'll, so I'm seeing, thank you for participating in the chats. So far I see uniform in a set of answers. It goes down, negatives. So, and I like that answer. So as you get more albedo, you get less temperatures. So, and you might say that maybe there's a delay, like maybe, you know, if you want to, we could put a little delay symbol here. Um, that's up to you for this discussion. The delay isn't going to matter too much, um, but it is important to get the polarities right. So now I see a negative, I get two negatives, which means this loop is at expected a positive feedback loop. So I can put a little plus here. And so that is the vicious cycle that we've already described of global warming. Now, the hard part is that we know that trees don't grow to the sky. There is no growth process that won't eventually uh, run out of fuel, that eventually uh, won't create a situation in which it is eventually going to slow down in its growth and maybe even turn around. Now, you might be able to come up with some counterexample to that. Um, I would guess that with you know conservation of energy or mass, whatever physics is going to pretty much um, make it so that whatever counterexample you can come up with, eventually we can find a limiting process. But even if there is a, a counterexample to what I just said, it's important for us to think whenever we get a positive feedback, what are the negative feedbacks? And um, in the case of global warming, people do think about like, oh, eventually the planet's going to fix itself. And so our question is, how is the planet going to fix itself? How is it going to regulate its temperature? And is that something that is realistic for us as a human society to wait on? So let's, um, this is a little bit harder. Does anybody have any ideas about what um, a negative feedback, a natural negative feedback? So I'm not talking about um, human behavior. I'm saying that if humans just let the planet go, what would be a natural negative feedback that would slow down um, global warming? So some people may uh, say habitat loss, and you might be able to come up with a story like, well, with less, ha with, with less habitat, you'll get less animals. Maybe with less animals, you'll get less CO2 production um, or something like that. That might, be, um, that might be the case. I mean, that gets a little hard to, to know because with less habitat loss, you also get less trees. So, um, 
So you have to sort of say like, what's, what's kind of worse there? So biodiversity could be it. Can we think for lower level? Can you think of um, where does carbon ultimately go that's in the air? So like it doesn't stay in the air. If we just, if you took all the life, um, well, not all the life, but, um, but ultimately um, plants, plants are one place the carbon goes. Can you think of a longer term storage of carbon? I see ocean. So, um, and then when carbon enters the ocean, it eventually becomes an acid, right? And so um, then, um, so, but eventually that carbon um, will get pulled out of the ocean and it'll get stuck somewhere else. And so there might be some temporary ocean acidification, but hopefully there are processes that get rid of that carbon once it's in the ocean and it builds things out of it. So can somebody think of things that come out of the ocean that are built out of, uh, out of uh, carbon? So I see fossils and, and fossils is related to what I'm talking about. What are other things that come out of, when you walk along the beach, what do you trip over all the time? Uh, coral, that's, that's related, that's shells. Shells, that's the simple thing that I was looking at here is just shells. And so that is one example where we can have up here, we can have chemical weathering. And so weathering here. And that um, basically takes um, extra carbon that is, um, that is above ground and it washes it away um, into the ocean where it can then be sequestered in, a, in bio sequestration. So I'm not gonna write bio sequestration all the way out here, but I can say bio sequestration in shells. So this is a biogeochemical process that will, in theory, eventually take carbon that has been put into the atmosphere and eventually take it out of the atmosphere and lock it up into a shell. And then it'll be stuck in that shell, much like carbon was stuck in fossil fuels that are down deep in the, in, in the earth. And so, um, so this process, let's think about the, the links here. So um, this is a chemical process and a lot of these thermodynamic processes here are aided by temperature. So we might have to ask a chemist to understand this link for sure, but let's say we go and we talk to a chemist and they tell us that yeah, as you increase temperature, then the particular metabolic process that goes into chemical weathering is gonna increase. Then we can say, okay, there's a plus here. So as you increase temperature, you're gonna get more of these chemical reactions or more of this weathering. As you get more weathering, you're making carbon available to organisms that build shells. And so this chemical weathering here, then that is going to end up having a positive effect because more weathering means more storing that carbon in shells. And as you suck more of the carbon out of the atmosphere, then the warming effect goes away after some delay. So I'm gonna put a little delay here and I'll put a little minus sign. And so now I only have one minus and so I have a negative feedback. And so, um, so that's, you know, I kind of stepped through that, you know, uh, just to kind of short circuit a little bit, but, um, but I just wanted to motivate some thought on that. Are there questions about this negative feedback that we end up drawing here and how we take carbon, um, you know, increase temperatures, increase processes that dump carbon into, um, make carbon available for other organisms to put it away into shells. And yeah, every time you run into a shell, um, that large, you know, piece of chalk, uh, you know, that you pick up <clears throat> off the beach is, you know, it had to come from somewhere. And the minerals that were in there, in part, came from uh, minerals that, you know, the carbon that was in the air at one point there. So this is, um, when we talk about bio sequestration, this is one of the ways we can talk about bio sequestration. Of course, you can also sequester carbon in tree trunks and lots of other things, um, but this is one process. So we could have come up with other processes to put in here, but I just wanted to put this one here. And I hope you can see that this process 
is extremely slow. And this process is extremely fast. And by fast, what I mean by that is if there's no global warming, um, and I see the questions, I'll take them in a second. By fast, what I mean by that is if, globe, if, the if, if temperatures are low, so we have very little global warming, then this loop pretty much runs uh, exclusively, and this loop pretty much doesn't happen at all. Now, as the temperatures get larger, then this second loop starts becoming more significant. And so that's what I mean by it's pretty much always, for us, it's always much, much slower than this loop over here. But eventually, it will become so fast that it will make a significant impact. But the amount of the temperatures we need for this process to happen are going to be such that it probably is not something that we can count on if we are depending upon this for human sustainability. And that's the reason why we probably have to implement our own negative feedbacks here, which um, are, you know, uh, which come from our human behavior. And so that is the argument that we kind of make here. And so you can kind of, I hope you sort of see the way we can try to make these causal links explicit to try to beef up our arguments. Because if we just talk about global warming, then you can always have someone say, yeah, but nothing grows to the sky. Eventually it's gonna slow down. We'll just wait for that and we'll be fine. So then you can come up with all of the different ways that there will be natural negative feedbacks and then try to then understand from a dynamical systems point of view if that is fast enough to be able to cope with the vicious cycle that we're seeing and you know you may have to use computer simulations to see whether these things are fast enough and what we end up probably seeing is that they're probably not fast enough and that's why we need to take action to either slow down this loop over here somehow or create our own negative feedback loop over here that's even faster. So um, I see a couple of questions here and let me handle those. So the first one, can you explain why I put uh, a delay symbol in? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so the um, delay symbols that I put in, like let's say this, sim this right here, um, what I was saying there is that if that the, the, there will be increased utilization of carbon by organisms that uh, are in the ocean that are building shells. And although we see increased utilization, we may not see an immediate impact on temperatures decreasing. It may take their, uh, it, we need to get the carbon out of the atmosphere and once the carbon's out of the atmosphere, then heat can start radiating out into space. And so this process of biosequestration does not instantaneously generate decreases in temperatures. And for me, I think that delay is significant enough that I need to make that explicit. And that's why I'm putting the delay symbol in here. Now, there might be arguments that I need to put delay symbols in somewhere else as well. Like maybe, you know, even if I get increased chemical weathering, it won't immediately be delivered to the little uh, mollusks and things that are building these shells. And because of that, then maybe I need a delay there as well. And now if you get to the point where you draw delays on all of your links, then sometimes you just have to sort of say, was it actually useful for me to draw those delays? Really, you only want to draw a delay when a small set of your links are significantly slower than all of the other parts of the process. Because then that identifies that although the rest of the process is trying to run at one time scale, it's gonna get stuck at another time scale. And that's what generates things like the oscillations in the shower. You have the ability to very quickly adjust the water flow in the shower, but the shower doesn't have the ability to quickly adjust the temperature. And that's what generates the problem. So I'm gonna move on to a couple other questions. If that doesn't answer your question, please post a follow-up. Can I explain the chemical weathering part again? Um, so uh, in this particular case, I'm not trying to sort of educate on the kind of biogeochemistry of global warming, um, but, um, and actually in this, about that, I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. And I've got a link down here. If you wanna read more about climate change feedbacks, I've provided this auxiliary link that's just right on Wikipedia. But the idea here 
is that as you get um, temper generally as temperatures increase, then reaction rates in chemical processes tend to also increase. And so chemical weathering um, provides um, a way in which you can get um, carbon that is in one uh, either in the air or tied up in uh, organic materials and end up getting it into water where it can be washed away and eventually into the ocean, where once it's in the ocean, then uh, mollusks and things like that can incorporate it into their own metabolic processes that create things like shells uh, or our bones, you know, things like that, which are you know, made out of calcium. So, um, so that's uh, the idea here was just that increased temperature in, uh, increases the, um, the ability to free up carbon so that it can be mobile. And once it's mobile, then it can become available for shells to make use of it. Um, there's another question, does overfishing and overharvesting these things cause an issue then? Yeah, so absolutely. We could add additional feedbacks in here. We are counting on there being organisms available that can help us with the biosequestration. If they're not available, then this whole feedback loop becomes any slower. It also helps us identify maybe we can amp up the number of these organisms. Maybe there's a way for us to raise mollusks so that they can increase their biosequestration or um, corals. You know that you know having more corals available may also help with this. And so if we can see the generation of these corals, it takes a very long time for them to grow these things, but <clears throat> eventually they can help us be a sink for these sorts of things. So you could imagine drawing additional feedbacks in here, both positive and negative, that can increase the rate of biosequestration or decrease the rate of uh, biosequestration. Um, so other questions here. I don't understand the argument of running out of resources. Are they saying that eventually there'll be no more ice to melt? That's not an argument. Uh, that's a bad thing. So um, what I was sort of saying here is that so that that's an excellent point that um, that you know. You know, ice is a finite resource, and we haven't really measured, you know, modeled the finiteness of ice in this process. But I think, um, you know, what I'm sort of saying here is I'm not, you know, trying to. I'm saying that there are arguments that global warming exists, but it is a natural process that will take care of itself. And so, if that's the case, then we, as sustainability scientists, need to account for all of the processes that might be involved in that taking care of itself, so that we can really understand um, whether it takes care of itself on our time scale or it takes care of itself on geologic time scales that basically, you know, shed us off, um, you know, in the process. And so, that's what I'm kind of, uh, you know, saying here. Um, and then, so there's, is this an argument against climate change or for it? So what, what I'm saying with this, this loop here is that those who would argue that climate change is not something that humans need to worry about are going to assert that these negative feedbacks, that either these positive feedbacks don't exist, but if we can justify that the causal links must exist, then the feedbacks must exist. Um, or they'll claim that there are negative feedbacks that take care of it without human action. And so what we're trying to do is sort of account for all plausible negative feedbacks here. And if we can account for them all and they all seem too slow to make a dent, then that means that we do need human action. We need to add our own negative feedback. Okay, and it looks like, gotcha. All right, so I think I think I've covered all the questions and I appreciate those of you who in the chat were doing a better job than I could to help answer some of those. Um, are there any other questions about this idea of how we built up um, this, um, this example here? All I was trying to say is that um, try to, to show an example of whenever we draw a positive feedback, your next thought should be, is there a negative feedback? Or more likely, what is the negative feedback? And so what goes into that? And is the negative feedback so slow that I basically can, you know, assume it doesn't exist? Like, you know, we probably, we shouldn't hang, you know, all our hopes on chemical weathering and biosequestration in shells. That might be happening, but we shouldn't count on it. You know, we shouldn't count on it being the one thing that, that saves us. And so, but now that we've made it explicit, we can make that argument. Before, um, if we just say, yeah, there are negative feedbacks that are out there, then 
no one, it, it, we don't actually have a rigorous argument there because somebody would say, well, if negative feedbacks exist, then let's not worry about the problem. Just let the earth take care of it. But the problem with the negative feedbacks exist argument is that dynamically speaking, those negative feedbacks that exist are too slow for them to be useful for us as a human species to be able to really take advantage of. Okay. So this is an example of S-shaped growth. Whenever you see reinforcing loops followed by balancing loops, um, the question here is about the scale. So when does the balancing loop come into play? And in many cases, the balancing loop is, um, is going to be so, for this type of case, when the balancing loop is so slow that this rounding off of the global warming or the global temperatures doesn't really happen until impossibly few, far in the future, then we have to come up with our own balancing loops to end up hopefully allowing this to round off at a much earlier time. But uh, this basic archetype here of a vicious cycle that is coupled with a balancing loop is going to be a very common archetype. And pretty much anytime you get growth, you're gonna have this balancing loop. Um, looks like there's some other comments here. Um, I don't go through whole, right, and so, you know, there's there's a, a nice question about how do you make these arguments without having to teach people about causal loop diagrams and stuff like that. And you know, I think you do your best in finding the these more metaphorical models. So if we go back to what started this all, I said this Met Office. This is a beautiful um, and simple way for us to explain to start a conversation with someone without having to get into the quantitative details. Now, as you drill, dig down deeper, eventually those quantitative details are necessary, but at some higher level, just trying to get someone into the conversation, then this diagram is readable by someone, even if they don't know anything about a causal loop diagram, just like playing Monopoly. You can teach little kids to play Monopoly, but you probably wouldn't enroll a little kid in a real estate course, you know, at the local community college. But if they played Monopoly, the day they go into that real estate course at the community college, they'll probably be better off than somebody who has played Monopoly. So that's kind of, um, you know, where, you know, you're, you coming into this class, you were sort of at this level. And we're just trying to use this class to bring you up to a point where you can make more quantifiable arguments as opposed to this, the kind of more uh, qualitative arguments that are made like in this diagram. Okay. All right, so any other questions about that? All right, so that was supposed to be a sample of how we use like S-shaped growth, that motif of a balancing loop followed by a, uh, uh, sorry, a, a reinforcing loop followed by a balancing loop. And we can, if we ever notice those, we can predict that certain things are gonna happen. The other way we can look at it is if we see certain behavior over time plots and we aren't sure what generates them, we can go back into our inventory of what are the kind of standard ways in which these behavior over time plots are generated. And that can tell us what loops we need to look for. Like, oh, you have a balancing loop, you probably need to also look for, or you have a reinforcing loop, you probably also need to look for a balancing loop in there. And so that's what we're moving toward. And so your textbook refers to these dynamic hypotheses. And so um, in chapter five, which is in the future, we, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, um, but they go over these six uh, fundamental modes of behavior. And so this is just a window into that. And you know, if you have just a reinforcing loop, you get just exponential growth. If you have just a balancing loop, then you get something where you get this goal seeking, kind of like looking for that optimal temperature in the shower. As you start combining them, you start getting um, combinations of these features. And so you get growth to a point and then regulation after a point. You can combine delays into them and that might start generating oscillations and so on. So the idea here is that there are certain feedback structures that are very, very, very commonly associated with certain behaviors over time. And if we start recognizing the relationship between behaviors over time and feedback structures, then it helps us when we're building models 
because we know kind of what loops we're probably gonna need in our models. And it also helps when we're analyzing models because if we see certain patterns of loops, we can kind of better understand why we're getting certain patterns when we end up simulating those. So just to zoom in on that, um, like for example, oscillation. An oscillation, which is you know this behavior over time where it just constantly oscillates, um, doesn't ever really settle down. These are typically formed by balancing loops with a delay in the loop. And then an example of that is the water example here. So in that case, we have, um, this is a comfort seeking loop where you're trying to seek a particular temperature. And there is a delay that makes it difficult for the adjustments you make in the flow of water to actually translate into adjustments in the temperature of the water at the same time scale. And so because of that breaking of time scale between how quickly you adjust the water and how quickly the water changes um, from the, the spigot, from the faucet, then you end up getting this delay behavior because you end up making overcorrections when in reality you should have just waited because your time scale was much faster than the time scale that the actual hardware in the wall could provide. And so that is what generates these oscillations here. So I can, if I see this pattern where someone shows me a balancing loop and they show me there's gonna be a delay, I can predict that I'm probably gonna get oscillations. And so in my mind, I anticipate oscillations. And then when I actually then try and experiment out in a real shower, when that real shower ends up you know, getting pulses of scalding hot water and freezing cold water, then I already have a mental model which has helped me explain what happened there. And that tells me that the next time I have to use the shower, I should slow down my actuator, which slow down my hand on that water faucet so as to not amplify the effect of this delay. So that's kind of one example there. Another example, going back to where we started, is S-shaped growth. When I see a reinforcing loop followed by a balancing loop, I typically am going to get growth followed by um, a leveling off. So, you know, a simple example here would be the old chicken and egg paradox. So if we um, don't worry about the, you know, which came first, if we think of it in kind of circular causality, not worried about which came first, but just recognizing that if you get more eggs, you get more chickens, and if you get more chickens, you get more eggs, then that sort of gives us a reinforcing loop. But we know that, you know, chickens aren't going to fill up the planet. And so that tells us we really need the balancing loop. And so the balancing loop here is as you get more chickens, you get more road crossings, you know, borrowing from the famous joke about why the chicken crossed the road to get to the other side. Well, so as you get, if you have no chickens, no chickens are going to be crossing the road. No chickens are going to be risking their lives. You have a lot of chickens, you got a lot of chickens crossing the road, and you got a lot of chicken death. And so um, at small population sizes of chickens, you are dominated by growth. But at large population sizes of chickens, the deaths of the chickens kick in and eventually their population levels off. Um, on a more abstract level here, then if, um, this is a, a diagram I borrowed from someone else in part because it's a bad causal loop diagram. This person used VinSim to draw it, but, um, but there's a bunch of things that I hope you can notice uh, you know, are you know are bad like you know they need they didn't label whether this is uh you know that this is a balance or this is a reinforcing and this is a balancing they've got um you know these these you know descriptions here townspeople come running that's like a description of an action so we need to work on this to turn it into a good cld but the basic idea is still there the first time you cry wolf you're going to get a lot of townspeople coming out to help but as you cry wolf more and more and more, even though initially you're gonna, you as the uh, bratty little kid are going to be um, really uh, excited by the attention you're getting and that'll make you cry wolf more. Over time, people will learn that it's not an honest signal when you cry wolf and they'll ignore you crying wolf. And every time you cry wolf and they don't come, Eventually, there's going to be a time where you're going to actually cry wolf and need their help, and they're not going to be around, and that's going to really put an end to this crying wolf stuff. So um, it's another example of this kind of S-shaped growth, where we expect there's going to be a leveling off, 
where <clears throat> the amount of crying wolf is not going to grow to 100%, it's eventually going to grow to some hopefully manageable level. Now, um, we've, you know, we're comfortable with those, we can start combining these things together. Um, right, so there's a, in the original story, doesn't the boy get eaten by a wolf? Um, and, um, and so that's, that's in a, that's an example, right, exactly. So um, the one time the boy gets so the boy gets eaten, then that is going to end up putting it, you know, a very quick end to this exponential growth. And so it'll be more like growing and then done. Um, so, so that's probably more of what's going on here. But still, it's the basic idea that there is a reinforce, there is a balancing process that ends up um, cutting off this growth at some point. All right, so um, we can combine these things. That's the beauty of these dynamical modes of behavior is that you can take a little bit that you understand about a little mode and a little bit you understand about another mode and put them together and get composites of that. And so one example of that is another mode of behavior that's more complicated growth with overshoot where we're gonna take our S-shaped growth and we're gonna combine it with oscillation. And remember oscillation was just a balancing loop with delay. S-shaped growth was just a reinforcing loop with a balancing loop. We put all three of those things together and we get growth with overshoot. And that is an example that's right here. And this is sort of an example that's very similar to the limits to growth example that uh, the Jay Forrester put together in the 70s. And the idea here is that you've got a, uh, a positive feedback human population with more humans, you get more births and more births, you get more humans. But you also have with more births, uh, you get less resources. And with if you had more resources, then over time you would have more births. That's what the delay is there for. So the fact that there is this delay between resources and births means that this whole negative feedback cycle is not gonna be able to act instantaneously. And so um, in other words, people are going to be able to keep getting born, even though there aren't the resources that will end up need, be needing to support them. And so you can get overpopulation where eventually those uh, babies get are, uh, old enough that need so many resources that those resources really aren't available. And then ends up um, you know, creating challenges in terms of scarcity for everyone on the planet. And so those create and an original, you know, a rise in population that eventually gets, you know, an overshoot, which we're seeing here. And then that overshoot will eventually get corrected, which is just kind of a euphemism as people don't have resources. And as it gets overcorrected, then there's opportunity for more births again, and you can get these oscillations. And this kind of goes back to this limits to growth example from Forrester, where depending on how he sets up the parameters, which in part, I was like, how do you set up this delay? Depending on how big that delay is, then you can get these massive crashes, or you can get something that's more gentle. So you still get human growth, but it levels off versus overgrowth and then collapse. And, uh, you know, there's questions of, is this happening right now? You could probably argue that that would take, um, you know, we've got, you know, there were seven point some fraction billion people right now. Um, you could argue what the, the carrying capacity of the earth is. We're probably getting close to it in terms of the humans and um, it's creating scarcity and that's slowing down the growth. So it, certainly the human population um, had less limits to growth hundred years ago than it does today. And you could argue that this is a dynamical theory, which explains why we feel more limits now and why we even got into this place to begin with, why those limits weren't so prevalent there then. So that's an example of how we take trajectories that are going on on the planet right now and then use these fundamental modes of behavior in order to try to, um, to make sense of them and look for these processes. All right, so any questions about that, how we're gradually bolting on these dynamical modes of behavior to build more and more complex causal loop diagrams? All right, so as you uh, think there, then let's do an attendance exercise. So I'll put the link in the chat. Um, right there. And the question I'll give you is 
what, and this is actually very similar to a question I've already asked, but what do we add to the S-shaped growth dynamical mode, which is just reinforcing followed by balancing, um, that once it's added will often lead to overshoot in the behavior over time. So again, this is very similar to a question, I think an attendance question I asked last time, what is added to the simple S-shaped growth model to generate instead of S-shaped growth, growth with overshoot and oscillations? So you can go ahead and give that a shot. All right. So um, up until this point, uh, we started with variables, we drew links, and we analyzed what loops result. Um, now I want to show you a slightly different perspective that is an introduction to where to the article that uh, you'll read for Thursday's class. And so in this case, we are going to be identifying um, loops that are present and then that are likely to be in place. And if we identify the loops that are likely to be in place, we can go smaller scale to say, all right, what are the small processes that must be involved in those loops? But we can also go larger scale and say, um, well, what other loops might be involved with those loops to help us build these much more complicated CLDs? And so to give an example of that, um, there's this cool decision tree that I'm gonna use here. And this comes out of the article that you'll read for Thursday's class, um, borrowed from uh, this systems thinker, which is kind of a central repository for systems thinking resources. And in, there's a Wikipedia article on systems archetypes, and that's kind of what we are, uh, we're starting to talk about here. And so the idea here is we can kind of think in terms of processes instead of uh, individual links and variables. And so the idea here is, let's say I walk into an organization and I know that that organization is interested in growing its organization. Well, rather than me focusing on exactly how that growth is going to happen, I can kind of think about what are some of the pitfalls that I anticipate are going to happen in that organization um, as they pursue growth. And so the first thing I'm gonna need, when I hear growth, I can go down this decision tree and I can say, all right, I need to start with a reinforcing loop. So I'm gonna put a reinforcing loop here and a reinforcing loop may have lots and lots of variables around it, but it most likely is gonna have at least two. It's going to have some demand that as you get more and more demand, there will be calls for action that create growth. And with that growth, you get more demand. And that generally is a driver for growth. And so this is a positive feedback here. Now, the thing that I have to think is that whenever I get growth, there's going to be a process that will limit that growth. And so um, this is the, in this decision tree here, this, but nothing grows forever. So in my head, I say this organization wants growth. So I'm gonna start by drawing, the, drawing a growth loop. And then I'm gonna think, but there's gonna be a limiting loop. And so I don't know what those limits are just yet but most likely the limiting loop is going to be bolted onto the side. And what it's gonna say is, is there more and more demand, then that is going to actually decrease my performance inside the company because it's just a lot of demand. And so I can't provide um, all of the same performance. And with that, um, that performance will then be related to that demand. So in other words, if the performance decreases, so will the demand. And then, so that's why this is a positive link. As performance decreases, demand for the product will decrease. But then likewise, as demand increases, performance will decrease. And so this ends up becoming a limiting loop, a balancing loop. So, in my, that, so that's fine. That's just S-shaped growth. But then thinking again, like the systems thinker, I can imagine how is this organization probably going to deal with this limitation? Well, what they're probably going to deal, do is try to imagine how much capacity they need in order to maintain some performance standard. So that's what we've got here, this performance standard right here. And so there is an additional balancing loop that they're probably gonna put down here. They're probably gonna say, what's our performance? How long are our customers having to wait in order to get their products delivered to them? And then based on a, the actual performance and that performance standard, that's going to change their investment in capacity. And we know that's like number of people who work for them. 
And then that with the investment capacity, eventually after some delay, we're going to get an increase in capacity, which will change the performance. This sounds like a good thing. This sounds like a company being proactive because they are trying to make sure that they uh, maintain a certain baseline performance in order to maintain growth. But time and time again, when people uh, implement this loop, they often do not set the right performance standard. If you accidentally set the performance standard too low, if you don't anticipate what performance you actually need to maintain growth, then what ends up happening here is this balancing loop ends up being an additional drag on your system because it turns out that the actual performance you need to maintain growth is going to be higher than your standard and you're forcing your system by an underinvestment in capacity to operate at a lower standard. And so you're actually slowing your own growth down. And so as we think about these things, like when a company says, I wanna grow for a long period of time, then I can think about typically without even worrying about how that company works, there's going to be a CLD involved in here and it's gonna involve growth, limitation, and an effort to reduce the limitation that where that effort, if not carefully uh, set up, can actually itself be an even further limitation on growth. And so if you're going to implement this feedback here, you really need to set the performance standard properly or have the ability to change that performance standard over time. So that's an example of how process leads me to identify potential problems in the future. Um, what I mean by is that uh, there's a question, if the performance standard was set too low, do I mean the performance standard of the employees or performance standard of the company as a whole? I mean kind of the company as a whole. So the perform the, it's like the company looks at how long it's taking for the employees to do their jobs, and that's telling them whether they need to hire more employees. Well, if they set the metric incorrectly on measuring their employees, then they're going to say, eh, we've got enough employees and they're not going to hire enough. Well, in that case, they're not going to grow. So if they set their performance standard improperly, then they won't hire employees when they really need to hire employees if they really do care about growth. All right, another example of that that I won't step through um, you know, step by step, but on the other side of this, if I was instead interested not in growth, but in fixing a problem, then there's another common set of CLDs that get bolted together that help explain a lot of these problems. And so, uh, someone personally, I'm interested in fixing a problem. What's the problem you have? Let's say you have a cash flow problem. So you don't have enough income. So a common way to deal with a cash flow problem is to borrow. So I don't have enough cash. And so I'm going to go to the bank and ask for a loan. Now, in the short term, that gives you money. But in the long term, it creates more of a cash flow problem that if you're not careful, is then going to actually increase the amount of borrowing you do. And so although this appears like it is a balancing loop that is um, fixing your cash flow problem, it actually generates um, a um, it actually generates more problems. And yes, S is same and O is opposite. Or in other words, S is equal to plus and O is equal to minus. Thank you for that in the chat for confirming that. And so um, for, so what they're saying here is like borrowing, once you borrow, um, it's not only are you going to have to pay that money back, but you're going to have to pay back more of that money with interest payments here. So this balancing loop in the short term appears to be a balancing loop, but in the long term creates a reinforcing loop where you have more and more of a cash flow problem. Because now you have to not only pay back whoever you originally owed, you have to pay back the people who you borrowed money from to pay back the original uh, people that you owed. So that's a particular problem. So if we walk down through the decision tree, I'm interested in fixing problems. Okay, you need a balancing loop. But what are the common problems with a balancing loop? Well, a lot of times the fix that you implemented in your balancing loop comes back to haunt you. And so we need to draw a reinforcing loop and think to ourselves, is there a reinforcing loop where this fix is going to come back to haunt us? Borrowing will come back to haunt you with interest payments. And so then we say, oh, so what's actually going on here? And so that's the, because I'm not getting at the real underlying cause. So what they did is they took this fixes that fail, kind of turned it on its side and then thought about it and said, you know what? 
fundamentally the real solution to a cash flow problem is financial controls. When I have a cash flow problem, I need to control my spending. And then over time, I will then not have a cash flow problem anymore. This balancing loop down here, this was the real solution to the problem. But by implementing borrowing, I actually not only generate more of a cash flow problem, but I actually make it harder for me to implement my own financial controls. Because as I get used to borrowing money, then I get rid, I give myself a loose spending mentality, which is going to reduce the balancing loop that was already inside me and hit it. So this is a, um, a shifting the burden is that rather than me determining, um, you know, by shifting the burden onto this symptomatic solution, what I end up doing is taking the effort away from what the fundamental solution that I should have actually done here. So this process shows here that um, that if I would that if I start with this system here, then it shows me that maybe I shouldn't be borrowing. Maybe I need to come up with an intervention strategy that strengthens my financial controls because this balancing loop is the one that's sustainable. This balancing loop is not sustainable. So that process helps me identify the sub processes I need to look for, which then help me identify the variables in the system that I need to attack in my interventions. So that is an alternative way we can use these causal loop diagrams. And every one of these dynamical modes that Moorcroft talks about can be found in this decision tree, which is incorporated in that document that you're about to read. And, um, and then, or if you go to this system archetype here, it has all of these ones in it here. So these are common archetypes that <clears throat> help us explain the standard ways that organizations or institutions behave over time. And so they identify problems and they identify opportunities for solutions. So that is an example of how we can build up complex CLDs by using the small CLDs we already have to be subcomponents that we can keep adding up until we have a complex system that has even more rich and uh, dynamical behavior, like the one over here, overshoot collapse and floating goal. That's one that's also over here. All right, so any questions about that? The basic idea behind you know using these loops as processes that help us anticipate potential problems and then using those dynamic, those complex CLDs to help us identify variables that we should be attacking. Okay. All right, so, um, so what, uh, so what we're going to do in the last um, 10 minutes of class here today is, um, is have you work on drawing a couple of these simple CLDs that you can then use in the assignment that has been that it's been available, but it's technically formally assigned today, which is assignment C1. And so just uh, reminders, um, there is a, a reading due on Thursday, so make sure you read the chapter in perusal and do the reading exercise and the reading assessment as is usual. Um, this assignment that is released today is due Sunday. It's another one of these things where you'll draw some CLDs and then them, and you'll turn them in in a Word doc so that we can grade the Word doc and also upload the MBL files just so we have them in case we need them. And, um, and that is sort of the, that's what kind of coming up here. So what I wanna do for the rest of the class today, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanna split you into a couple of breakout groups. And because we don't have a whole lot of time, I might just jump to part two of this activity in part. Um, so basically this is the assignment that you're gonna be coming up with. I think it has um, two or three parts where in the first part, I ask you to draw an S-shaped growth uh, causal loop diagram and uh, draw it and Vince them and put it together. And then in the second part, which I think um, I will have you break into groups to try to brainstorm about, um, I have you uh, draw this drifting goals archetype, which is an archetype where, uh, well, you can read about it um, here, where this is an archetype where you've got two balancing loops that interact, but they don't interact in the same way that they do in the escalation archetype. And so, um, so what I, we're gonna do is put you into groups for about 10 minutes um, and uh, I will hop around to those groups. And originally, if we had more time, I would have you 
go into groups for a shorter amount of time and then trade with each other. But instead, I'm going to just have you try to do the whole assignment in your group together. And then you're free to use those um, in your uh, submissions for the, um, the, the activity that is due on Sunday. So are there any questions about that? Um, Basically, I'm going to break you into uh, breakout room groups, and then you can go to this URL that I will put in the chat. Uh, SOS 212 activity C1. Let me make sure I type it correctly. Activity C12. And if you go to that URL um, that I put in the chat, it basically is a Google Sheets expression, and you'll be able to go to a page with your group number on it and you'll be able to work and you can actually watch other people work as well. And so disregard the whole like swapping stuff. So let's go into breakouts for a couple of minutes and I will pop around as will Eric to the different breakout rooms to help you guys do some brainstorming on this uh, example. So breakout rooms here, sign automatically. Okay, here we go. 